Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we answer your questions and interview thought leaders in health to help you transform your body, mind, and life with cutting edge science and common sense wisdom. Did you know that up to 90% of Americans are not getting enough of the nutrients that are critical for healthy functioning? 90%, that's nine out of 10 people. <laughs> Astonishing numbers. Anyway, what's worse, these nutrient deficiencies may contribute to cause issues in our health for decades to come. So in other words, the problems that manifest don't happen on the day that you don't get enough nutrition. They might happen 20, 30 years later in, uh, in the form of some disease that you could have prevented by doing the right thing and eating a little bit of edge or fruit or uh, or healthy, nutrient-dense, grass-fed, pastured animals, for example, many years before. Anyway, today, to help us all sort it out, Dr. Mark Hyman is here. Dr. Mark Hyman is a practicing family physician. He's the director of the Cleveland Clinic's Center for Functional Medicine, and he's an 11-time number one New York Times bestselling author. Now, before we get there, here's the review of the week. This one's from uh, a man named Neil. He says, I'm 41 years old and have just completed the 40-day wild diet challenge. I was 100% strict the whole way through. In 40 days, I lost 22 pounds and my body fat percentage dropped from 21.5% to 14%. I feel better than I ever have, and I will be continuing. My aim is to get from the 204 pounds today to 190 pounds and 10% body fat. The diet is now my way of eating. The food is delicious, and at no point have I felt deprived in any way at all. What more can I ask for? Thanks to the wild diet, I'm in the best shape and health I have been for years. I cannot describe how mentally and physically great I feel. My sincere thanks, Neil. Neil, that is fantastic to hear. 22 pounds in 40 days uh, is more, <laughs> that's better results than I got when I first started. Um, but anyway, absolutely, more than anything else, it's your, uh, it's your mindset that sounds like it's in really good shape. So I appreciate that. The wild diet is, is meant to be more of a lifestyle. So I love hearing that you're feeling mentally and physically sharp. So thanks so much for sharing your story. Uh, if you're out there, you took your health into your own hands and you're feeling better and shedding fat, I would love to hear about that. So shoot me a tweet at fatburnman, email me at able at fatburningman.com. You can also just go to fatburningman.com, uh, sign up for the email list, hit reply, and I do my best to read through all of those as often as I can. And, uh, you know, you could wind up being featured on this show or even better being a guest on this show, because as I know, uh, you know, a lot of you have written in and said that you love hearing health uh, leaders on this show, but you also love hearing uh, about real life people who are trying to put this into action. You love hearing their perspective. So I'll do my best to keep having some of you listeners on the show as well. So and now if you're asking yourself, what happened to Abel James? I've been listening to reruns for like the last year. <laughs> Where has this guy gone? Well, anyway, Allison and I moved up to the Rocky Mountains, and we didn't have proper internet for uh, more than six months. And this is something, if you've been following us for a while, we lived in the Smoky Mountains without internet or, or, or only phone-based internet for many months as well. That was right before the ABC TV show. So, you know, we kind of enjoy unplugging from time to time. And uh, it was also, we didn't really have a choice if we wanted to live here. That's the way that it was. So uh, anyway, during that time off, We've been doing a lot of recording, a bit of traveling, and learning how to record and produce in virtual reality and 360-degree video with spatial audio. If that all sounds like gobbledygook, basically, it's, uh, <laughs> it's something that is easier to experience than explain. So I encourage you to just go to ablejames.com, whether it's on your uh, phone, tablet, or your computer, or even your virtual reality headset, um, you can view these th new 360 and VR videos uh, with whatever device that you have. And it's really cool because you can look around the whole room. 
Or if we're at Yellowstone, for example, you can look around and you can see a geyser right in front of you. Or you can see fumaroles and mud pots and uh, all of these beautiful colors from a place that is actually quite dangerous, where you could be boiled alive and, and dissolved by uh, by the hot springs and uh, or, you know, basically perish in the gigantic supervolcano. So anyway, if, if you don't want to visit in real life and you enjoy virtual type adventure tours. Uh, I'll be releasing more than a hundred in the next few months. Uh, I'll be releasing a new 360 video every day, whether it's a music video or adventure to, uh, nature type video for the next year. So you can check all of that out at abeljames.com. Whether you're into uh, dinosaurs, we uh, have a tour of Dinosaur National Monument, uh, in 360 VR, also volcanoes, the real life Oregon Trail. You can check it all out. Uh, also, by following me, Abel James, on social media, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and a few of the other social media platforms now support 360 and even VR video. So if you follow me there, uh, then then you can watch some of those videos. And if you don't, then, you know, and you're on those social media platforms, uh, go check it out. Hit the subscribe button. And that way you can know which instrument I'm playing or uh, which place we visited and you're touring every single day for the next year. It's been a lot of fun and I can't wait for you folks to see it. The early feedback has been excellent. So I'm really excited for you guys to experience all of this with us and also get to know, uh, get to know both of us a little bit better as well as our dog Bailey. Okay, so... You know, one of the other really exciting exciting things that we've been able to do in the past few months is launch Wild Superfoods, which is our own family business. Um, uh, if you live in the United States, uh, then you can help support us that way. But basically, we have Future Greens, which are like uh, vegetables that you can take on the road. We have a super high quality vitamin D stack. We have omega-3 uh, supplements. And we also have probiotics. So if you're interested in any of those things and you'd like to help support the show and you live in the U.S., hopefully it's coming international soon, please visit wildsuperfoods.com. All right, on to this show with Mark Hyman. You're about to learn the sad truth about the food-like substances we're eating, how Europe banned GMOs and reduced pesticide use by 65% while America continues to put GMOs in our food and increased pesticide use by 21%, why antibiotic use in feedlot cattle farms is doing more than fattening up our cow friends, what do we need to watch out for in the near future, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Dr. Hyman. Welcome back, folks. This is Abel. Today, I am very excited to be here with Dr. Mark Hyman. He's a practicing family physician, the director of Cleveland Clinic's Center for Functional Medicine, and an 11-time number one New York Times best-selling author. Thank you so much for being here, Doc. Yeah, I'm so excited to be with you guys. I know 11 times isn't quite enough for you yet, and you're working on a lot of really cool uh, projects. I got, but I got three, I got three, three book deal now. So. Yeah, you got a got, bunch more coming. All right, maybe, cool. I'll, maybe I'll get to like 14 soon. There we go. <laughs> well, let's start with with a quote from your most recent book, uh, and I just <laughs> love this. It's not like we haven't heard it before, but it's very succinct and very true. You say the sad truth is that much of what we eat is not really food; it's more of a food-like substance. And that doesn't sound particularly appetizing. No, I mean, you know, I, I, in my lectures, I show a slide of this food with 37 different ingredients, only one of which is food, banana puree at the bottom of the list. And I try to show this in the lecture. And I say, well, what, what do you think this is? Can you guess? Anybody, can you guess? Yeah. And not one person has guessed because you can't tell what it is by looking at the ingredient list. It's a Twinkie. Right. Yeah. So I said, if you banana can't, if puree. You can't, is that what's in the middle? And, and like, well, no, it's like a, one of the like bottom of the 37 <laughs> ingredients. It's, Gross. But it's incredible. It's, it's incredible. The stuff that passes off as food. And if you actually look at processed food, you cover over the front of the box, of the package. It's very hard to tell a pop tart from a corn dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do these exercises where I have people literally cover over and just look at the ingredient list and try to figure out what the food is. And most people cannot tell. So if it says, you know, uh, tomato, water, and salt in a can, 
you know what that is, mm -hmm. right? But if it's, you know, 47 different ingredients from different kinds of processed foods or things you can't pronounce, you don't know what it is, it's not really food. And the truth is that food is information, right? So it's not just calories. It's not like, oh, well, it's just only, you know, Twinkie calories or broccoli calories. The same as long as you don't eat too much, you're not going to have a problem. That's just not true. The science shows that food is information yep. and that it gives instructions that can upgrade or downgrade your biological software with every bite. And when you eat food that has different kinds of chemicals in it that our bodies aren't used to using or forms of nutrients that are weird, you know, like highly processed flour, mm -hmm. it's a very different experience for the body in terms of what happens as a result to your metabolism, to your brain chemistry, to your hormones, to your gut flora. It's critical. So people don't understand this, this idea of quality of food is more important than quantity and the information is actually critical in terms of what you're putting in your body so when you're eating foods that have bad information which is most of the processed food out there creates disease and, and ill health right and it's really easy i think for people who aren't necessarily on a health kick to just skip right over that part it's just like oh they've got an apple here and they've got a twinkie here they both look like food they both seem like they would you know taste reasonably good and, and fill you up in in one way or another. But uh, I think in your book as well, it said something like the average child has eaten a, an average of 7.5 pounds of chemicals and additives, <laughs> right? By the age right, of five, like right. that stuff is information too. The wrong kind. <laughs> it's absolutely true. I mean, the, the American Heart Association says that Trix is a heart healthy cereal. Mm. And if you look at the ingredients, it's, you know, all kinds of sugar and, and different kind of processed grains, but it's also red dye, blue dye, all sorts of chemicals. I mean, what are those things doing to kids? And we know that, mm -hmm. that in randomized controlled trials, they feed kids like a drink looks like a red Kool-Aid yep. versus like a red drink that sort of tastes sort of the same. It's like from, say, pomegranate. And the effects on these kids' behavior is dramatic. The ADD, the mm -hmm. hyperactivity, the inattention, the violence. This is from the food we're eating. And people don't realize the connection between your mood and behavior and the food we eat. And we see this linked to everything from poor school performance to violence. I mean, one study was remarkable. They literally took prisoners who were violent prisoners in prison, mm -hmm. gave them a healthy diet compared to the typical diet they were eating, and they reduced violent crime by 56% in the prisons and by 80% if they added a multivitamin because these people are so nutritionally deficient. And I had one prisoner write me a letter. I mean, I, I came one day and my guess was a letter from this prisoner who read my book, one of my books, changed his diet in prison. I don't know how he did it. He said, I realized my whole life I've been a violent criminal because of what I was eating. And now I feel completely different. I mean, wow. people don't understand the power of food as like I said, information. Well, it changes your psychology. It, it has a control over us that we barely understand. And let me ask you this. You're a very well-researched guy. You're, uh, you've been a practicing physician for a very long time. Um, yeah, I have to practice because I keep not being very good at it, so I have to keep <laughs> practicing. <laughs> but anyway, you're, you're probably one of the most informed people there there is about uh, what these these additives and kind of fake foods or processed foods do to us, but do you even know what they do? <laughs> like if you take one of those ingredients, it's ammonium sulfate or some other preservatives. Sure, like sure. Well, you know, there is a lot of data on this. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of data on various food additives. I write about it in my book, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat? And different effects they have, but they're all different. For example, yeah. uh, some of them may, may be cancer causing. Some of them might be excitotoxins like MSG, which right. also increases hunger. Some of them might be altering your gut microbiome. Uh, there's a whole group of emulsifiers, for example, that are in, even in healthy, you know, like, you know, natural foods, you get whole foods like carrageenan, which actually disrupt the gut and cause leaky gut, autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So there's there's all sorts of things. Even there's there's this whole thing that that's used in the food industry. It's not even on the label to make food processed foods stick together. It's called uh, microbial transglutaminase, which is Yum. sounds like a big word. But essentially, it's 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 where they get bacteria to manufacture gluten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's used in the <laughs> that's food. That's what we gluten's need. <laughs> Yeah, well, glute, you know, gluten leads, leads to a lot of inflammatory issues for many people, but it's yeah. hidden. And it, it's called gluten because it's gluey. It makes things stick together. So they may, make this in the lab and then they put it in the food. It's not even on the food label. And this also has been linked to autoimmune disease. So there's all kinds of stuff in food. You have no idea. And, and it's, it's driving all sorts of health issues for people. Right. And these, these 
various ingredients can act synergistically in a negative way within the body to manifest in diseases or, or dysfunctions of various kinds. But it's not necessarily something that we're actively researching that much. Um, cause, cause why would we, if in a, in a world of capitalism, right? Totally. I mean, we, we were, we're really not looking at this carefully. And I think, you know, there are groups that have, have paid attention, but you know, the FDA is not regulating these things. It's almost like, you know, let's, test it on the population first and if we find out later it's a problem let's take it off like trans fat which was in the food supply for 100 years yeah. was invented in 1911 as a basically crisco as a health food and everybody thought it was so great and it became you know this new great thing that's better than butter right mm -hmm. turned out it was the worst invention ever and it's killed literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people maybe millions over the years from heart disease and other issues because the FDA allowed it to be used without being tested first. Mm -hmm. So this is the approach. It's not, you know, practice the precautionary principle where you're, you know, evaluating compounds, testing them and seeing what happens over periods of time. It's just like, okay, let's use all this crap and then let's see what who could, who dies from it and then let's mm -hmm. take it off the market. Right. Well, that's not a great plan. It's really not yet when most of us, myself included, when we walk into the grocery store or wherever you buy your food, Typically, you, there's this assumption that everything here is safe and everything here is food. Maybe it's just because, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> that's an optimistic worldview. But unfortunately, it's not necessarily a worldview that will lend itself to health down the road. How do you help people kind of, I guess, the biggest change that people need to make oftentimes if they want to focus on their health is that change in worldview, which is which I guess kind of means sacrificing a bit of your optimism. How do you deal with that? Well, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Strategically I, I, optimistic. You know, I'm very optimistic. I just think if people have their information, they know what's going on. I, mm -hmm. I, it's, you know, I, I had a profound experience with a family in um, South Carolina as part of the movie Fed Up. And this family was desperate. They were living in one of the worst food deserts in America, mm -hmm. in South Carolina. They had $1,000 a month for food stamps and disability for a family of five. They just wow. really were very poor. They lived in a trailer. They were really sick. I mean, they were morbidly obese. The father was 42, already had kidney failure from diabetes on dialysis, couldn't get a new kidney because he was couldn't lose the weight. The mother was, you know, plus 100 plus overweight. The son, 16, had basically pre-diabetes and was morbidly obese got up to 328 pounds, wow. uh, you know, this is like a teenager. Yeah. Uh, and they were desperate to do the right thing. And they were having low fat this and diet that, and they were having all this processed food that they thought was right. They didn't know how to cook. And I, I went into their kitchen. I didn't like give them a lecture. I went in, I said, let's see what you got. And we pulled everything out of the freezer and the cupboards and the fridge. And the, we looked at all the labels together and I explained to them what was in the food. I showed them and I did the trick where I covered the front of the box and asked them to identify what it was and they couldn't tell. Right. And they were just astounded. They had no idea. And then they thought they were eating Cool Whip because it was healthy because it was, you know, uh, had right. no trans fats in it, but it's all yeah. trans fat. It's all because the food companies have lobbied the FDA to allow it to say zero trans fat at less, less than half a gram per serving which, you know, Cool Whip does because it's all air, and but it's still all trans fat and high fructose corn syrup. So they, they were doing everything wrong. Yeah. They wanted to do everything right. It wasn't like they were like, oh, we don't care. We want to just be fat and sick. And like, no, they were desperate, yeah. crying because they didn't know what to do. Yeah. And I realized that most people don't have the right information. And then they were able to lose a couple hundred pounds as a family. The son end up, went up to lose 100 and I think uh, 28 pounds, which is amazing. Wow. And, you know, he he was actually able to figure out how to eat to change his brain chemistry and metabolism. But it was it was like, wow, you know, this is not we live in a society where people just don't know and they're mm -hmm. trying to do the right thing, but they don't have the right information. And that's really why I write my books and I, I talk and I'm doing this podcast because I feel like we need to have people become aware. And when people are aware and then they're supported to make those changes, they can make huge changes. Yeah. And I really appreciate that your book. Uh, your latest book basically focuses on the confusion and how to handle it because uh, I, I started this show about seven years ago now and it's amazing how much like the, the culture around nutrition and food can change in such a short period of time but if anything it's gotten so much more saturated with uh, misinformation or competing information and a lot of times it can be 
it, it can be very divisive, right? Even between, say, paleo and vegan, which is a nice inroads to your pegan approach, which I think is great because it combines the, you know, two worlds that are actually quite similar to each other, makes it less yeah. divisive and just turns it into, okay, this is, this is the general framework for how a healthy person could eat, right? Yeah. Would you yeah, mind explaining exactly. that? Like, how do you meet in the middle there? Well, you know, I, I was on a panel once with a friend of mine who was a cardiologist, a vegan, uh, kind of a Milton vegan. And then there was a a paleo doctor on the other side, also a friend of mine. And they were like fighting. And I'm like, hey, you guys, cut it out. You know, if you're paleo, you're vegan. I must be pegan. And I sort of laughed and everybody laughed. I'm like, oh, whatever. It was just sort of like a stupid yeah. joke. And I went home and I started thinking about it. And I was like, wait a minute. You know, there is more in common than there is different, right? For sure. Both groups agree we should be eating whole foods. Mm -hmm. Both groups agree we should be eating no processed foods. Both groups agree we should be eating food that's low glycemic, meaning low in sugar and starch. Mm -hmm. Both groups believe we should be eating a lot of vegetables and plant foods. Both groups believe we shouldn't be doing anything to harm the earth or harm the planet or harm the animals. Uh, both groups feel like we should be eating you know, lots of nuts and seeds and mm -hmm. we should get rid of processed oils and we shouldn't eat dairy. And like there's so many things in common. The only thing that's different is whether you eat animal foods or beans and grains, like yep. that's pretty much the only difference. Yeah. And that's a big, it's a big difference, but it's still, when you look at those, both those approaches compared to the traditional American diet, or we call the standard right. American diet or the sad diet is, uh, is, is quite different. Yeah. So I think, I think I was like, wait a minute. And then I think, you know, we should be eating food that also is aspirational, you know, food that doesn't mm -hmm. harm the planet. I mean, I went to a restaurant in San Francisco called The Perennial, which was amazing. It was, a, it was the first restaurant that's designed to only produ produce or provide foods that help reverse climate change. Wow. So if you eat meat, it's coming from a regenerative agriculture ranch, right, where the soils are being restored and Very the cool. ecosystems are being restored. Or, you know, so it's like it's fascinating where, where you can kind of go. But I think Nobody, both those groups believe we shouldn't be eating food that contains hormones, antibiotics, mm -hmm. pesticides, you know, like additives, chemicals, like there's so much in common. And so I, I try to sort of bring that together and go, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't be eating, you know, three pounds of meat a day. Yeah. We should be eating a diet that is, you know, low, lower on the food chain. But, you know, if you eat animal foods, it should be restorative. Mm -hmm. It should treat those animals well. It shouldn't contribute to climate change. It shouldn't be filled with hormones and and my story if we fish we shouldn't be overfishing the oceans or we shouldn't be supporting nasty fish farms that produce bad quality fish and uh we should be you know creating more sustainable approaches so those are mm -hmm. aspirational and i think you know, they can't always do that but uh if you you know you look at those two camps it's very similar and i think it, it, there's a set of principles that we all agree on and they're yeah. not they're not they're not that controversial. Mm -hmm. And if, if you take away all the noise on the extremes, it's like there's a core of, of principles about healthy eating that the science supports and that, in, in fact, all these extreme approaches kind of support. Yeah. I, I guess, unfortunately, in the days of, of social media and Internet hype, you see the extremes more than anything else. That, that just gets the vast majority of the attention. So anyone who identifies as vegan or vegetarian or paleo or what have you are branded as a caricature of of what you described instead of like the healthy principles right yeah 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 and there's funny spoofs on it. i don't know that guy jp sears he does funny spoof on <laughs> like great. if carnivores ate it behave like vegans you know yeah <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> don't eat those vegetables in front of me it makes me feel bad you know it's like very very funny it's like sort of making fun about all the extremism which i think we have to see move move beyond yeah well along those lines though there is there's a lot that I've seen, in, even in the past couple of weeks, that are about hardcore car carnivore, I think they call it, or hardcore, like the cream cheese keto approach, where it's basically just no vegetables, no anything except for like pure fat and pure meat forever. Would you mind yeah, commenting yeah, yeah. a little bit about, about that? About keto? Well, not necessarily keto, but a, I guess it's about the Cliff Notes keto Right. It's like keto is something that should you should come into it with a fair amount of education and hopefully correct information. Yeah. But a lot of people come in and they're just like, all right, I'm going to eat bacon, butter and cream cheese for the next week and see no, how that goes. You no, know? no, 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 no. I have a friend who's a, ve a keto vegan, actually. Oh, really? Uh, so she, yeah. And uh, she's doing amazing. She's type one diabetic. Her blood sugars wow. are normal. 
and she's, <laughs> you know, kind of, and there's a whole group of keto vegans out there, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of ways to, to do each kind of a diet. I mean, you can be, you know, omnivore or, or paleo and eat like tons of sugar, kind of natural sugars. You could eat tons of meat, which isn't sustainable, mm -hmm. or, or you can be a vegan and eat chips and soda all day. Right. Yeah. So there's... <laughs> The question is like, what are the principles of healthy eating? And within each of those, you can sort of focus. And I think, you know, you, you really need to be smart about the quality of the food. So if you're eating like cream cheese and bacon all day as a part of your keto approach, it's not a great idea, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. What? Why not? Well, I think you want to eat foods that are going to reduce inflammation. Mm -hmm. And often dairy is very inflammatory. Uh, so is often, uh, you know, nitrates and processed meats are not the best for you. Um, so I think, you know, small amounts can be okay. And I think if you look at, you know, the, what you want, you want high quality foods in your diet. So you yeah. want a lot of plant foods. You want a lot of nuts and seeds. You want a lot of really good fats, olive oil, avocados, coconut oil. Those are all great. You know, mm -hmm. having you know, whipped cream every day is probably not the best thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also it's, uh, the way that I like to think of it anyway, is that you, you kind of get a little bit of a meat quota. You get a bit, which is kind of indulgent. Maybe it's salty meat, but more of like a mm -hmm. condom meat. Isn't that what you call it? It's you treat your meat. Well, I, like yeah, con I call it con. Exactly. I call it condom meat. <laughs> it's basically, you know, downsizing <laughs> your meat intake and, and that's good for you. It's good for the planet. I think um, we don't want to be consuming huge amounts of animal because I don't think we need them. Right. I think, you know, there's a lot of conflicting research around how much protein we need. And I think, to be honest with you, I think I've seen, you know, a lot of research on each side. Uh, you know, some people say we need, you know, 30 grams per meal. Others say we need less if, you know, we can use other approaches. So I think it um, depends on your health status, mm -hmm. depends on your age, depends on a lot of things. But you know, we do need high quality protein, but you know, we don't need a huge amount, you know, 20 to 25% is probably plenty mm -hmm. of our calories. Um, and I think you can go to the other extreme. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I talked about, you know, having three quarters of your plate as non starchy vegetables, that mm -hmm. should be your the bulk of your diet. Yeah. And then the side, you know, we, we usually like have a beef steak in the middle of the plate and two asparagus or string beans on the side, you want like, the plate to be massively stacked with veggies, which yeah. by the way, fills you up. And then, you know, a side dish of protein. I love that. Yeah. Uh, now, people who aren't necessarily doing that uh, might not experience anything right away. It might feel great, in fact, to eat nothing but cream cheese for days on end. But you risk something <laughs> called, that, that you describe in the book, long latency deficiency diseases. Yes. Uh, which a lot of people, I don't think they think much about that. But could you... Could you explain how that manifests over time and what exactly happens to the body? Well, uh, yeah, so people can feel bad acutely from eating bad food, and, mm -hmm. and that certainly happens. Uh, but often, if, you're new, if your food is nutrient poor, uh, we get what we call these long latency deficiency diseases. For example, let's say your vitamin D intake to get scurvy, I mean to get rickets, you need to get 30 units, mm -hmm. which isn't very much. But to prevent osteoporosis, to help your immune system, to prevent cancer, to reduce death rates, you might need, you know, 4,000 a day, mm -hmm. right? So over time, you'll develop these efficiencies. Or let's say you have, you know, folate, you have a low-grade B vitamin deficiency or insufficiency. If it's acute, you'll get anemia. But if it's over a long period of time, you might get cancer or heart disease or dementia, right? So these are what we call long latency deficiency diseases. They're not based on having, you know, a true deficiency like we used to think of scurvy, yeah, but you know, it's like how much vitamin C you need to serve you? Not much, maybe sixty milligrams a day. How much you need to to optimize your immune system and do everything else? You might need a thousand or more. So this kind of go on, goes on to say that you you don't want to have a mono diet. You don't want to eat a large amount of a very few amount of foods, right? You you really want to diversify. It's funny, you know, we had we had. Um, I think 800 species of plants as a hunter gatherers in our diet. And we eat only a very few foods. I mean, in America, the top five vegetables, I mean, the top five vegetables are potatoes in the form of French fries, yep. tomatoes in the form of ketchup and pizza sauce, Jeez. <laughs> corn, which is, you know, the sweet corn, which is mm -hmm. okay. Although I don't know if it's actually it's not really in that vegetable. form. Yeah. Uh, and onions, which are fine. 
Yeah. And then, of course, uh, iceberg lettuce, which is basically cardboard with water in it. (laughs) So we can do better. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really the issue is how do we how do we rethink what we're doing so we have a more variety in our diet? Because there's all sorts of healing compounds in food that you're not going to get if you just eat one food. Mm -hmm. Right. For example, if you if you have spinach all the time. You're not going to get the benefit if, for example, you have dandelion greens, which are full of amazing uh, nutrients. It's like 10 or 20 times more antioxidants and, and minerals and vitamins, but also has, for example, all these resistant starches and, and, and also these, these um, prebiotics, mm-hmm. which help fertilize your healthy gut bacteria. So mm-hmm. you want to make sure you get the right thing. So now let's switch gears to people who are trying their best to do the right thing. Uh, you mentioned in the book, we don't live in a perfect world, which should be obvious to anyone. But like if we did, then we wouldn't have to supplement with uh, basically anything else for our diet. Um, yet it, it seems like it's more responsible these days to kind of spackle the gaps with certain nutrients mm-hmm. that, that we know most of us don't get enough of. So would you mind explaining what a few of those are? You mentioned vitamin D. There's also omegas and a few others that you mentioned. Well, you know, I have a very unique experience, which is that I've been practicing functional medicine for over 20 years, and I and I have been testing people, <laughs> nutritional tests. So people go, oh, but well, people aren't nutritionally deficient. Well, it's not just my experience, but the government has a survey called the NHANES survey where they do testing on people, and they look at tens of thousands of people over many, many years, and they find that 99% are deficient in one or more nutrients at the minimum level. That's the RDA. 99%. Now, not not how much you need to get optimal health, but what's the minimum you need to not get scurvy or whatever. Mm-hmm. 10% of a population is deficient in vitamin C to the level of scurvy. Uh, really? Folate deficiency. Yeah. Uh, 99% are deficient in omega-3 fats. 80% are deficient in vitamin D. And I've been testing this. I check people's omega levels. I check people's vitamin D. I check magnesium. I check zinc. I check a lot of the B vitamins and other things. And you see the massive amounts of deficiencies that has impact on people's current symptoms, but also their long-term health. So I think I think we have a tremendous amount of these going on, and I think people do need to eat an optimal diet. So for example, I had a patient who was like, okay, I don't wanna take supplements, but I'm, I'm figured out, you know, if I need this many milligrams of vit- or units of vitamin D, I need to eat these many herring and sardine and mushrooms every week. Mm-hmm. And if I want this much zinc, I need to have this many pumpkin seeds. And if I want this much selenium, I need this many Brazil nuts. And she was like obsessed. And I'm like, all I've right. Been there. Fine. I've been there. <laughs> you know? I'm like, all right, but but it's okay. But you, you know, most people are not gonna do that. Now right. you want to have as nutrient dense a diet as you can, but you know, most people do have significant issues. And you know, it's it's sometimes it's 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 in it's it's not diagnosed by doctors because they're not trained in nutritional physical exam or nutritional testing. And so all I can tell you is after seeing, and, then, and of course I see a sick population because they come to see me and they're not going to go, I feel great, test me, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I see people who are sick, but I can tell you the level of nutritional deficiencies is massive. And and even people who think they're eating well and doing well, it's like I don't see that many patients who are going to McDonald's and having French fries and Coke. Yeah. I see people who are trying to do the right thing and they're still deficient. And when I'm, by the way, when I have a few of those patients who I call them virgin patients who've never really addressed their health, yeah. the amount of nutritional imbalances is astounding. Really? So is there, is there a good way to link that to how that manifests in, in terms of the disorders that they come in with or the diseases that they come in with? Probably not always, but. Sure. I mean, you know, people come in, for example, with, you know, migraines and headaches or constipation or anxiety or insomnia, palpitations, muscle cramps. I go, oh, you have magnesium deficiency. Or if they have mood issues or dry skin or flaky skin or dandruff or other issues, they dry mouth, they might have omega-3 deficiencies. And mm-hmm. people come in with, you know, frequent infections and maybe they have zinc deficiency. So I, I can kind of look at the history. It's not perfect. And in my books, actually, I... And particularly in uh, Ultramind and the blood sugar solution, uh, I, I talk about uh, how to identify these deficiencies by certain symptoms. So I give you questionnaires, mm-hmm. and you can map out actually whether, whether you have an issue or not. Yeah. Now, so for a lot of these people, uh, do you have any idea? I've, I've always wondered, like, what percentage of, of foods or meals most uh, Americans eat out at restaurants that, that they don't cook at home, that they don't prepare themselves? Well, do, you, do you know? We, yeah, we used to eat um, 2% of our meals out of the home in 1900, and now we eat 50% of our meals outside the home. 
Jeez. And, and you know, the, you can't control the quality of the food you're eating, where the raw materials come from. And most of the time, if you look at the load of food in our diet, it comes from basically commodities, three commodities, which are, are funded by the government through crop insurance, basically ag subsidies. And it's, it's flour, it's wheat, corn, and soy, which comes out as flour, white flour, mm -hmm. which is a higher glycemic index than sugar, two, high fructose corn syrup, and, not, and all the other weird corn ingredients that are in processed food, and three, refined soybean oil. Yeah. And those are turned into processed food. If you look at any processed food, it has those ingredients in it. And, and the people in a large survey, again, a government survey, 60% of our calories, more or less, come from these three foods. And the people who consume the most of them are the sickest. They have more, mm -hmm. most obesity, most diabetes, heart disease, cholesterol issues, hypertension. If you consume the government-sponsored foods, <laughs> it's amazing, right? It is. That, and that's not the only difference or, or the thing that kind of makes America uh, stand out, I guess you could say. Also, um, you mentioned in your book the difference between how much Americans typically spend on food um, uh, and spend on their own nutrition, which I think is like 9% compared to Europeans, which is 20%. So the norms are completely different. Yeah, completely. So we, we – and, and there's some interesting you know, global surveys of what people are eating and how much they spend on their food. But it's up to 50 percent of people's household budgets in some places. So I think we have to get you know, really serious about what do we value? Are we spending you know, $1,000 on an iPhone? Are we going to you – know? I mean there was an amazing study that was uh, done recently by Geisinger which uh, is a health system mm -hmm. and they they are they are self uh, sort of uh, they're like an HMO in a sense they're they're internally funded so it's basically they're incentivized to get people healthy as opposed to treat more sick people and the the worst diabetics in their community were costing $248,000 a year what? per diabetic oh yeah man. because of hospitalizations and medications and disability $4 million and a year. The, so what they yeah, so what they did was they they said look we're going to give people twenty four hundred dollars a year in food healthy whole food and we're going to support them to learn how to use it eat it and take care of themselves. These were the most food insecure, the worst controlled diabetics. They saved one hundred ninety two thousand per patient. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm not kidding. You. So this is like spend twenty four hundred dollars on real food. Wow. Skip the hospitalization. Skip the medication. Help the diabetes, help the people. You know, it was like the That's most insane. amazing. So we're, we're working with, uh, you know, Medicare and Congress to help try to fund these kinds of ideas. But, you know, using food as medicine has the most powerful effect. And it's not like it's, you know, oh, you need medication. The food is a sort of a side dish. No, this, the medication is a side dish. <laughs> it's yeah. the dessert, not the not the main course. Geez, we need vegetable vouchers from insurance companies or something like that. Yes. I mean, no, they, really it's, it's, called, it's called food pharmacy. There's actually prescriptions. The doctor provides a prescription. They take it to the food pharmacy, and that's oh, cool. ha starting to happen. That's yeah. really cool. That's, that's exactly what we need. It's so simple. It's just it's hard to make that lifestyle change yourself without support. What people don't realize is there is a lot of support out there. You just kind of have to <laughs> get on the right train, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, I do have a question that, that came in from our community, and this one's kind of tough. I haven't ever asked a doctor this specific question because it, it kind of made me think when I read it today. But he says, how do you talk to your standard family practitioner or doctor about helping you get healthy instead of prescribing you the quick fix? Say if they can't find a functional doctor around them or, or if they're just kind of stuck with their current um, you know, practitioner, how do you... How do you meet in the middle to try to, you know, <laughs> go after the vegetable vouchers? I mean, you have to you have to sort of see if someone's willing to work with you. They may not be aware or educated, but say, will you work with me? Can you do these tests? Mm -hmm. Can so I think people need to be empowered with the right information. So I have a whole guide on how to work with your doctor to get what you need, which share you know shares with them the research, shares with the test the kind of test you want to do, and you have to be an empowered patient and consumer. So if the doctor is willing to work with you, great. And if they're not and they think it's all nonsense, then you know you might need to find another doctor. Yeah, <laughs> it's that simple, I guess. What about um? Uh, functional medicine, like people who haven't experienced, uh, I guess, alternative medicine or kind of gone colored outside the lines at all. Like, how do they make that transition to someone who who shares who shares your belief system? 
Well, I think in terms of finding a doctor or in, in terms of doctors, nutrition, basically your view of health is, is, I would say, fundamentally different from a lot of other physicians who, you know, are more yeah. conventional. I mean, you, you, this is changing, right? We're now doctors are now understanding the limits of, you know, interventions with medical therapies like drugs and, and surgery. They're understanding the role of nutrition. They're, they don't, may not know the details of it. They understand that, that healthcare is changing. They understand the science around systems biology. So there's more and more openness to this. There's more interest in this, even if they're not experts. So I think, you know, you you have to become your own best advocate and you you can ideally hopefully find someone who knows what to do and but if not a lot of this stuff you can do yourself i mean mm -hmm. i i wrote the ultra mind solution which is about how to fix your brain by treating your body first yeah and uh, this woman came in and she's like well you know i had all these issues but like i i'm fine i'm what are you dealing with well i'm good now i'm like why are you here well i read your book and it took nine months to get an appointment so wow. i figured i'm just going to do everything in your book and then see what happens. And she got all better. And then it was like, <laughs> all right. So, and I, I, you know, a lot of this stuff is about self care. It's about diet, it's exercise, it's sleep, it's stress, it's taking some basic supplements. There are layers of things that are hard to deal with, like if you have heavy metals or really bad gut issues or infections like Lyme disease. These can be, you know, you need some expert to help. But most of the time, you know, you can do this on your own. Yeah. Even testing, there's now available, testing is now available for right. people on their own. What would you recommend as, as uh, the things to look for in testing for people who are just getting into it? Well, I, I think, you know, there's there's traditional tests, which the doctors do, which are really looking for disease. Mm -hmm. And they're usually only abnormal when th things are really bad. So functional medicine testing, I think, is super helpful because it, it or even looking at other things are, uh, that you can do through conventional labs because it gives you an idea of what's your function. In other words... Not like, are you, for example, dying of diabetes, but mm -hmm. like, how close are you to optimal, right? If your blood sugar is 80, you're great. If it's 100 or 98, that's bad because it means you have prediabetes. Yeah. Right. Or if you're, you look at your vitamin D, it should be 50 to 60. Some doctors will say, well, the level's 20 mm -hmm. of the limit of what's ideal. No, it's not. 20 is like, so you don't get rickets, right? Yeah. But like, how much you need to get really healthy, it's probably, you know, a level of 50 to 75. So you can start to know this. And I write a lot about this in my books and what to do. And it's kind of in there. So I think, you you know, people can really find out online or they can go to how to work with your doctor to get what you need and just Google that. You'll find it's free online. So I would certainly have people be more empowered around that. And you can even do, there's companies that do self-testing, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool where you can actually order your own tests, which is really amazing. So yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of fun to geek out on that. If you have any bit of nerd in you, which I certainly do, I, I, I had fun when I first started getting into those charts. Yeah, you know, there's, and there's like people are doing like self-testing for genes and all kinds of uh -huh. stuff like 23 and Me. So there's, there's definitely ways to do that. Yeah. Um, let's let's shift gears a little bit because there's there's just so much that's uh, that you've covered in your body of work. One thing that I really appreciated in uh, your most recent book is you talk about in the past how, you know, the conventional wisdom and, and what most people thought was healthy, including yourself, uh, including me back then too, was low fat, right? That was oh, yeah. the, oh, the my God, paradigm. Yeah. That was what everyone just assumed to be true. Uh, but you mentioned how important it is to be open-minded uh, over the course of time, not just as a physician, but as a person. You need to give yourself permission yeah. to not have all the information all the time and always be right and be, you know, funneled into this one day way of doing things. You need to be more open than that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, here's the deal. I mean, I I was trained that fat was bad, that cholesterol was bad, that it's going to cause heart attacks, that fat makes you fat. And I recommended those diets, low fat diets to people and told me a lot of grains. And I, you know, I, I actually saw improvement when I got people eating whole foods because whatever they do, in other words, if you eat a low fat vegan diet or mm -hmm. a high fat, you know, paleo diet, yep. if they're whole foods, you're going to do way better than anybody eating a standard American diet. Right. Right. And then eventually, if you're on a low fat vegan diet, it may cause issues. You know, I've seen people 
you know, have high levels of triglycerides, low HDL, they get more blood sugar issues, inflammation, mm -hmm. if they're eating a vegan diet. And I, you know, I, I, people get mad at me when I say this, but there's a lot of fat vegans out there, you know, sure. you know, and I think, I think the, the issue is because you can do a very poor job of eating a vegan diet and eat more starch and sugar and carbs. So, and so I basically tell people, look, if you, if you look at the data over time, it changes and you have to keep up with the data. So we used to think that, you know, fat was bad. And now the government has said there's no restrictions on total fat. There's no restrictions on cholesterol. Yeah. The dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease. And this is like, and it's, it, it didn't even reach the headline of the news because it was like buried on page, you know, 472 right. yeah. of the report because they were like embarrassed that they never really looked at the data. Same thing's happening with saturated fat now. We finally, we got... Uh, we got the USDA, uh, well, actually, the National Academy of Science, a friend of mine, were working to change the dietary guidelines. They got the National Academy of Sciences to review the guidelines process and found that they ignored huge amounts of data on low-carb diets, on mm. saturated fat, and they had in, in, in industry influence. It was unduly influenced from that. And so we, we have corrupt dietary guidelines. We have guidelines that don't reflect all the data. That's changing. And I think yeah. there's still stalwarts that believe that this is all bad, but it's really, really changing. And I think it just have, you have to keep up with the changes. So, And we don't always necessarily need more data. Sometimes it seems we just need a little more common sense, right? Like you, you mentioned also that we, sh you know, what are the things that are not food or that you shouldn't really eat? Anything you see advertised on television, anything that didn't exist in our uh, grandparents or great grandparents uh, age of living, you know, what are some other things that are just dead giveaways for this is no matter what the data says, this is not good for you. Yeah, well, you know, it's just remind me of what Mark Twain said. He said the problem with common sense is that it's not so common, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I think we get all kind of discombobulated in our head and our approach by trying to look at all the nuances instead of just stepping back. And, okay, what it makes sense here? Does yeah. it make sense for us to eat highly refined processed food? Does it make sense to us to eat a thousand times more? processed vegetable oils than we ever ate in, in the history of humanity. Yeah. Probably not. Like, you need a big study <laughs> to prove it? I don't know. Like, yeah. you know, should we be eating, you know, not 22 teaspoons of sugar a year, as Hunter gathers, but 22 teaspoons a day? Probably not. You know, should we be eating food that, you know, is full of all these chemicals and additives that haven't been studied? Probably not a good idea. Should yeah. we be eating a lot of foods with hormones, antibiotics? Probably not. What about GMO? Who knows? But you know, again, this is a large uncontrolled experiment on the human population. <laughs> we might find out 50 years from now is a problem. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I hadn't really seen before, at least not these numbers, um, you talk about Europe banned GMOs while well, America went full steam ahead. Obviously, we have, we yes, have tons of them. Yes. Uh, but the most important thing is the yields actually weren't better uh, for GMOs in America. Uh, the U.S. increased pesticide use by 21 percent, while Europe saw a 65 percent percent reduction and you know people just hear pesticides and it's like yeah we're spraying pesticides but when you when you see it on one of these big farms like we drive cross country all the time when you see all of those chemicals toxic chemicals being sprayed all over the place uh it's it's quite obvious that you don't want to be there you don't want to be breathing that in you you don't want to be eating that food no no <laughs> i mean it's pretty interesting i think we 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 have really still to figure out what the consequences are of of this whole experiment. It may not be that, for example, the GMOs are that bad for your health, but for example, with, with glyphosate, which mm -hmm. is what we spray on GMO soybeans, which are resistant to this herbicide, uh, the glyphosate might be the problem, which right. is not the GMO, but it's the, the, the ability to use these herbicides in high concentrations. And what they're finding is it's becoming resistant. So if you use more and more of this, we now know from the WHO, the World Health Organization, this is a carcinogen that that it may disrupt the gut microbiome, that it affects glutathione, which is your main antioxidant, anti-cancer compound in your body. Mm -hmm. So there's like, oh, wow, well, maybe this is, <laughs> it's a complicated story. But the whole idea that GMO is gonna save the world I think it's kind of a it's kind of a bit of propaganda. I mean, there may be yeah. uses for it. There may be great applications. It may be great in certain developing countries. It's not all bad. I just think we are we have to be honest about it and right. to, you know to say, look, maybe this is providing some benefit, but like there are unknown risks, and we have to be cautious for sure. And there are also intentions that aren't necessarily aligned with 
our health, right? Where it's like most of these genetically modified organisms are created so that they can spray as much toxic <laughs> pesticide and herbicide onto their plants without them dying as possible. It has nothing to do with, you know, increasing the amount, the amount of vitamin C that you're eating from that or, or anything. I know that they're experimenting with some of that stuff, but we do have to ask ourselves when like the average apple that we get from the grocery store is a year old, um, <laughs> <laughs> why we need to be monkeying around with all of this stuff instead of just eating fresher food, right? <laughs> or like having a garden again or going to the farmer's market. Or whatever. There are quite simple answers to some of these problems, but yet we keep just throwing money at these, these kind of crazy solutions to different problems, which cause more problems, right? <laughs> Destroys the environment, our health, and a whole bunch of other things. It's not like we can't make improvements, um, but I think it is, People have, have had a lot of propaganda about that sort of thing, and everybody's confused. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, the food industry is very invested in keeping us confused. Uh, yeah. There's a book coming out in the fall by a colleague, um, Mary Nestle from NYU, called mm -hmm. Unsavory Truth, about the role of the food industry in nutrition science corrupting the science. So by, if the Dairy Council... It? Funding it yeah, or? the Dairy Council funds a study on dairy as a sports drink. Guess what? It's awesome. If yeah. an independent scientist funds, for example, the research on, for example, artificial sweeteners, 99% of the research by the food industry on artificial sweeteners shows they're safe. 99% yeah. of the research by independent scientists on artificial sweeteners show they're harmful. Right. <laughs> so who do you believe? So yeah. it, it confuses the, it, and, they, and, they, and they have the money to fund all this stuff. So it confuses the public, it confuses the research literature, and it corrupts our view of what's true and not true. Yeah. And I think it's hard for, and then and what happens is the media doesn't do their job. They don't go, oh, this study was funded by Coke, which shows obesity has nothing to do with soda. Right. <laughs> you know, and that's an extreme example, but there's a lot more subtle examples where people, and yeah. there's sort of, you know, the integrity of science is an issue. Um. I love this. We could talk all day, but we are coming up on time. Uh, before we go, I want to make sure I lob you a softball question. <laughs> Maybe it's not that softball, though. Um, wh what are you eating today? What does your meal frequency look like? What does the plate look like? Well, I pretty much 90% uh, of the time do what I say I, I, you should do. 10% I might not. Uh, but mo mostly I, I don't eat processed food. That's mm -hmm. like a – there's no negotiation there for me. Like I'll never buy a bag of M&Ms. I'll never – buy a Doritos. I'll never drink a can of Coke. Like I just never do that. Yeah. Um, I think I Great eat advice, a very low <laughs> plate. I never, you know, basically, you know, I never eat, uh, uh, food that is, is basically processed in that way. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do eat a very low glycemic diet, which is low in starch and sugar. I eat a lot of great fat. So for example, an average day for me would be wake up, I'll either have, sometimes I'll have do intermittent fasting, so I won't eat until noon, okay. or I might have a bulletproof coffee. Um, sometimes I'll have a, you know, some pasture raised eggs with an avocado, tomato, some olive oil. And then I might have for lunch, my, I make up what kind of fat salad. So the other day I made a lunch with pumpkin seeds. I grilled some tempeh. You can put a can of sardines or salmon on it. Uh, olives, avocados, olive oil. So a lot of different kinds of fat, right? Yep. Nuts, seeds, olives, uh, avocados, uh, fatty fish uh, with lots of greens and salad. And dinner, I might have, you know, three or four different vegetable dishes. So I might make a sweet potato. Uh, I might, you know, make a side of asparagus. I made, uh, what did I make the other night? I had, uh, we made like a, a broccoli with garlic and lemon olive oil, ginger and asparagus, some roasted mushrooms, and then maybe like a small piece of fish or protein uh, as a side dish. And and then I'll you know I'll sort of have really good dark chocolate. Uh, I like a lot, eat a lot of nuts and seeds. Now that's sort of basically my diet. Yeah, I have a salad here for lunch. I hope it's good. <laughs> yeah. What is this? This is a salad. Oh, there we go. Uh, you can see Look here. at that. That's was, uh, beautiful. Which is I got from a local place. But it's basically avocados and uh, a little hummus in there and onion. I mean, um, you know, tomatoes. and It's pretty good. So, so it's not like, you know, I, I kind of know how to hunt and gather in my neighborhood. That's that's a great point because a lot of people might think that, oh, it's I've never eaten 
any of those things before. Like I've, I've, had, I've coached certain people who have never seen a tomato before, never seen an avocado or what have you. But um, what mm. a lot of people don't understand, especially if they haven't been on that health kick before, is that this stuff, especially these days, is getting easier and easier to find, especially in certain places, not necessarily a food totally. desert. But I mean, even in airports, I travel, I've been traveling for a long time, but even in airports, it's easier now. You can find nuts, mm-hmm. you can find different healthier snacks, you can find grass-fed beef jerky at yeah. Starbucks. It's like, so I think, uh, you know, you have to know how to hunt together. So most people spend their lives within a very circumscribed area, right? Mm-hmm. Their home, their workplace. And they, you know, they, they frequent the same, you know, areas. So you have to know how to hunt and gather in your neighborhood for food that's going to help you and support you if you get an emergency or you need to make sure you plan ahead and order stuff. Like I order stuff from Thrive Market, which is a discount Whole Foods online, like Amazon meets Whole Foods meets Costco. And, and basically you get this stuff delivered and I have snacks and bars and you know, it's processed food, but it's like whole foods. So if you read the label, it's like, okay, a bag of olives or, right. you know, it's like nuts or like whatever. It's pretty elemental food. And I, I, I just think it's important to think about planning because most people don't think about planning. Mm-hmm. They just sort of are what we call opportunistic eaters. And if you do that, you're going to be in trouble. I need to eat now. Like I'm all, I, by the way, I, I, one of the things from a habit point of view is I yeah. always do is I'm always, I always know in any given day what my food experience is going to be. And I mm. plan it ahead. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not like stuck and I'm thinking, okay, we're having dinner, we're having lunch, we're going to do And like I, I sort of, it's almost automatic now. When I travel, I bring at least a day's worth of food with me in my bag. Yeah. We do the same. <laughs> yeah. With, yeah. yeah. Like then it's not, I don't bring like, you know, big salad. I bring like high density fat and protein. Mm-hmm. And, you know, nuts and seeds, nut butters. I bring, you know, grass fed beef jerky. I bring, you know, that kind of stuff. So that, I mean, it sounds like a lot of food, a lot of different kinds of food, but I didn't hear anything that sounded particularly difficult to prepare, even if you were doing no. it yourself, right? It's like salads, you put some oil on there. and I mean, I'm so busy. Like, I don't have time to cook. Like, I yeah. mean, I literally make three meals in 30 minutes a day total. So I've learned how to be very efficient. Mm-hmm. But like, if you have more time, you can make fancier stuff. But you don't have to make fancy stuff. You can just eat vegetables, stir fry them, steam them, a little olive oil, salt, pepper. It takes a few minutes. It's not like a long time. You know, my, I can mm-hmm. get in the kitchen. In 20 minutes, I can have dinner on the table. Like, no problem. I love that. You know? <laughs> I love that. You're, you're a health nut who has zero time to cook. <laughs> but that takes away the excuse, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And when I, I don't have time, I make things that are a little more, you know, complicated, but it's really not that hard. Yeah, well, I, I think that's so important because a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't necessarily allocate time for cooking or we just don't have time for cooking because of our jobs, careers, kids, the traveling, all sorts of different things. But uh, if you can do it, <laughs> and I know that you're one of the busiest people in the world, if you can do it, then mm-hmm. anyone who's listening to this, you can give it a fair shot. Totally, totally. All right, so we're just about out of time, but um, before we go, please tell folks where they can find you a little bit more about your new book as well as anything else you might be working on. Well, I, uh, they can find my book, the new book, Food, what the actually I eat at foodthebook.com. I've got a great new podcast, uh, if I say so myself, Congrats, called The Doctor's yeah. Pharmacy. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, Place for Conversations That Matter. We're having great guests and deep conversations. Uh, and I... Um, you know, I have a great online uh, Broken Brain documentary that is available for free. If people go to brokenbrain.com. It really teaches them about how to fix their brains, which most of us have problems with. Uh, and I'm working on a lot of policy stuff. Uh, we just got the General Accountability Office to review all of our food system wow. and all the policies that relate to our food system. I'm working on Medicare to pay for food pharmacy. I, I'm working in Cleveland Clinic to build uh, functional medicine and do research uh, or you know, hoping to get a giant donation for reversing Alzheimer's and diabetes. So I think we're, we're doing a lot of good work and, uh, I'm really excited about the future. I think people are trying to catch on. And after 20 years of beating my head against the wall, I feel like the light is suddenly breaking through. It's working. It's working. It's working. Your work is so important. Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for spending time with us. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? 
please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or Fat Burning Man. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week.